Good morning and welcome virtually to the Center for Constitutional Studies at Utah Valley University in Orem, Utah. I'm Scott Paul. I serve here in the center as interim director and executive director. Speaking on behalf of my colleagues, we are thrilled to spend these two days with you examining American federalism through the lens of the COVID-19 pandemic. Before our first panel begins, please allow me a few words of introduction and, and acknowledgement. Organized in 2011, the Center for Constitutional Studies is a nonpartisan academic institute that promotes the instruction, study, and research of constitutionalism. Our mission is to increase constitutional literacy in our local, state, and national communities. We pursue this mission in a multidisciplinary fashion to more effectively equip a new generation of citizens and leaders with the broad understanding that is critical to the perpetuation of constitutional government, ordered liberty, and the rule of law. We at the center express deep gratitude to the Utah State Legislature and especially to the legislature's Utah Federalism Commission for their enduring commitment to functional federalism and for their support of our Federalism Index project. We also thank UVU Provost Dr. Wayne Vaught and UVU President Dr. Astrid Tuminez for their support of our center. Last but definitely not least, I must acknowledge Dr. Andy Bibby, who serves as Associate Director here at the center. Dr. Bibby leads the Federalism Index Project, which I'm sure he will describe at some point during this conference. He, along with his outstanding team, organized this conference. Perhaps my biggest regret of this virtual conference format is that you won't have the pleasure of being on campus to interact with, our, uh, with the amazing students here at the Center for Constitutional Studies. Thanks to the generous support of the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Utah Federalism Commission, and especially the Wood family, nearly 20 incredible research assistants call the center a home away from home. Simply put, the center is nothing without them. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to the moderator for, of this session, Dr. Andy Bibby. In addition to serving as the Associate Director here in the Center for Constitutional Studies, Dr. Bibby is an Assistant Professor of Political Science. He teaches classes in political science, political theory, and American heritage. His latest book on Thomas Jefferson and his political rivals will be published by the University of Virginia Press this December. So without further ado, Professor Bibby. All right, welcome and thank you everyone for joining this uh, Federalism Project virtual event. My name is Andy Bibby. I work here at the Center for Constitutional Studies and also teach courses in the History and Political Science Department uh, at UVU. I'll be helping to moderate today's first session. Because this is the first panel of the conference, I thought I could just start with uh, a brief background of how we got here today. Uh, so for background, this conference is one of three major public events planned for this year, organized by our team at the Federalism Index Project. Uh, we'll have a spring academy and a summer workshop for teachers. The Federalism Index Project is a data visualization uh, project launched in late 2016, focused on the study and understanding of American federalism. For the sake of time, I will just make two quick notes. First, the aim of the federalism initiative is to provide usable data for educators and state leaders and to make it available in one digital space. We do this by collecting and aggregating empirical work on federal state relations and then connecting that data to federalism committees and partner organizations across the country. Um, this is an enormous project still in its infancy and as you can imagine, we are only now just in the beta testing phase of the website. So if you're interested in learning more, uh, we encourage you to reach out to us, get involved, uh, make suggestions for improvement, uh, or even to request data sets. Uh, like I said, this is a large project and there is just simply no way we could do this without the support of a large uh, active network of scholars and friends across the country. So thank you to everyone who has contributed so far and thank you especially to the Utah Federalism Commission for making today's program possible. 
Now, let me just say a word about our relationship to UVU before I uh, introduce our speakers. Our research team is, is fortunate to be housed in the Center for Constitutional Studies at UVU. As such, we share the broad mission of the CCS, which can be summarized in two short phrases, promoting constitutional literacy and defending civil dialogue on campus and in all of our interactions. Now, today's events are meaningful for at least two reasons. First, this conference is the result of many years of planning, research, and collaboration with the Utah Federalism Commission. Uh, by our last count, there are only 18 states with active federalism committees that include members from both the House and the Senate. The Utah Federalism Committee Commission is one of these and one of the most active and innovative committees in the country. Um, I, so I say it's exciting to be here because we would not be here without the support of the Utah Commission on Federalism. Second, this conference is also the result of the support and leadership of the late Rodney K. Smith, who served as director of the Center for Constitutional Studies for three years. Dearly, but we hope to honor his legacy, not only by supporting constitutional literacy, but by working together to do so in the spirit of civility, good faith, argument, and a genuine love of learning, debate, and education. Uh, finally, a quick uh, word on the conference theme. The title is Federalism on Trial, Lessons from COVID-19. The first part of the title is playful and maybe a little provocative. After all, federalism, which divides powers at different levels of government in the United States, is one of the most important structural features of the US Constitution. And so to hint that federalism is on trial is also to suggest that the US Constitution itself is on trial or that it's being questioned or challenged in new ways as a result of the strain and pressure from COVID-19. To put it simply, our question for the conference is this, is federalism working in the context of COVID-19? If not, what could be improved and how could we do better? With that, I am uh, genuinely thrilled to turn to our first panel on the topic of understanding federalism. We have three outstanding scholars to kick things off. Professor John Kincaid, Professor John Dynan, and Professor Jennifer Celine. Uh, since I have taken so much time, please allow me to introduce the first speaker uh, Professor John Kincaid, and then turn the time over to him. Professor Kincaid is the Robert B. and Helen S. Maynard Professor of Government and Public Service and Director of the Maynard Center for the Study of State and Local Government at Lafayette College, Easton, Easton Pennsylvania. He is an elected fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration and recipient of the Distinguished Scholar Award from the Section on Federalism and Intergovernmental Relations of the American Political Science Association. Among his many accomplishments in the field of federalism, Professor Kincaid was senior editor of the Global Dialogue on Federalism from 2001 to 2015. He was also the editor of Publius, the Journal of Federalism from 1981 to 2006, which is the crown jewel of journals in federalism studies. He was also the executive director of the U.S. Advisory Commission on Intergovernmental Relations from 1988 to 1994. Among the impressive list of published works, he is also most recently the editor of a research agenda for federalism studies. Uh, Professor Kincaid, please correct me on the title, uh, published in 2019. Um, we just don't have enough time to do justice to what amounts to a lifetime of a vital contribution to federalism studies. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it's a real honor. Let's start with you first, uh, Professor Kincaid, the time is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Andy. Um, I appreciate uh, your kind words. Uh, I'd like to thank the Utah Federalism Commission 
uh, <clears throat> the Center for Constitutional Studies and Dr. Bibby for inviting me uh, to this exciting conference. And uh, in fact, the conference I think reflects partly the degree to which the pandemic has generated a pandemic of writing about federalism, uh, <laughs> which is producing a lot of new federalisms. It reminds me of William Stewart's 1984 book in which he cataloged 497 metaphorical federalisms from abortive federalism to destructive federalism, spaghetti federalism, and world federalism. So the new federalism spawned by the pandemic will be just as ephemeral as spaghetti federalism. And if the Democrats capture the White House and Congress, academics will produce still more new federalisms. This abundance of metaphors does not signify theoretical sophistication, uh, but rather the lack of theory and also naivete about institutional uh, structures. So COVID-19 has posed a major challenge to the federal system. The system has responded comparatively poorly if measured by cases and deaths, not so much because of structural flaws, but because of partisan polarization and a president not amenable to cooperative federalism and a coherent pandemic response. Of the nine OECD federal and quasi-federal countries, only Belgium, Spain, and Mexico have performed worse than the United States as measured by COVID deaths per capita. The principal problem is partisanship. The parties are not functioning to integrate the system as they often did in the past, but rather to fragment the system. The system demonstrated resilience, however, because the state's constitutionally protected police power enabled them to compensate to some extent in a dual federalist manner. The states also functioned as laboratories of democracy, reflecting diverse policy preferences and pandemic experiments. Although dual federalism was a second best solution in principle, it was, it seems to me, the best politically solution, available solution. Now, many critics argue that a key failure was the, la <clears throat> the lack of a single federally managed presidentially led national response. However, given the emergency uncertainty that accompanied the novel coronavirus, the best course of national action was not readily evident at first. <clears throat> Nevertheless, it seems to be largely forgotten that initially <clears throat> the federal government responded rather vigorously. President Trump restricted travel from China on January 31st on March 13th, he issued 57 simultaneous disaster declarations for all states, DC and the US territories, the first all state declaration in US history. The Families First Coronavirus Response Act passed by 90 to eight Senate votes and 30, 363 to 40 House votes was signed on March 18th, providing 95 billion in new outlays. The Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act which passed by a 96 to zero Senate vote and a House voice vote, provided 2.2 trillion. The April 23rd, 484 billion Paycheck Protection Program and Healthcare Enhancement Act passed the House by 388 to five and the Senate by a voice vote. On June 5th, Trump signed the Paycheck Protection Program Flexibility Act, which passed the House by 417 to one and the Senate by a voice vote. In addition, the Federal Reserve implemented many stimulus programs, including 2.3 trillion in lending to support household, households, employers, financial markets, and state and local governments, including a municipal liquidity, liquidity facility for the state and local bond market. The Principal Act, the CARES Act, offered an array of aid programs, including about 150 billion in direct aid to state and local governments, taken all together, Congress provided state and local governments with about $360 billion. After this burst of bipartisan activity from mid-March to early June, however, things fell apart as partisan fissures opened between parties in Congress, between Congress and the White House, between the White House and governors, and among groups of governors as well. One consequence, of course, is that Congress has not passed a second stimulus. Whether this is desirable or undesirable depends on your point of view. Uh, the major stumbling blocks are different philosophies of fiscal responsibility and the age-old federalism conflict over how to distribute federal aid among states in a way that does not unfairly benefit certain states at the expense of other states. Meanwhile, the federal government lacks constitutional authority to command a national response. When Trump claimed total power to reopen states' economies on April 13th, he retreated the next day under heavy criticism, 
Former Vice President Joe Biden citing a constitutional issue, similarly retreated from his mid-August call for a national mask wearing mandate. Now he's apparently limiting his mask mandate to federal property. Further, the Trump administration's pandemic performance lends little confidence that a presidentially led federal response would have been desirable. Moreover, if Trump has authoritarian inclinations, a national response might have exacerbated those proclivities. Crises often precipitate centralization and executive action and centralization. And there's little evidence of this so far, although some executive actions such as Trump's directing the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in September to issue a nationwide moratorium on tenant evictions to reduce infection transmissions triggered alarms in some quarters. So let's look at COVID-19 from the perspectives of some currently prominent models of federalism, one being nationalist cooperative federalism. The contemporary school of nationalist federalism defines cooperative federalism as states' willingness to comply with national directives. The model treats states as though they are prisoners of war, facing a jailer who says, if you cooperate, you will get extra rations. If you don't cooperate, we'll hammer you. Advocates of this model contend that states actually enjoy their status as prefects of the federal government because they have wiggle room in implementing federal policies. This model situates uniformity and finality for first order norms at the national level while allowing dialogue and plurality at the level of state implementation of those norms. But this model is ill-suited to the pandemic because it ignores James Madison's warning that enlightened statements will not always be at the helm. And thus, whether first order norms emanating from the Trump administration would have been desirable norms. The pandemic also puts the school in the odd position of having to say that the governors who implemented the strictest and longest lockdowns were uncooperative, a position wholly endorsed by President Trump, who called these so-called uncooperative governors mutineers and tweeted such messages as liberate Michigan. Part of the problem may be that in situating first order norms at the national level, this model does not specify just what the legitimate source of first order norms should be. Must these first order norms emanate only from acts of Congress signed into law by a president? Or can they emanate from Supreme Court rulings, presidential executive orders, and agency regulations? The notion that anything coming out of Washington, D.C. must be viewed as a first order norm requiring state compliance leaves no room for what we have traditionally understood to be federalism as a system of non-centralized power rather than a decentralized unitary system. This model doesn't seem to leave any room for loyal opposition either, namely states and groups of states that might have rational and legitimate reasons for opposing certain first order norms emanating from the federal government. On what grounds can one label states that have opposing points of view uncooperative? Given partisan polarization, moreover, first order norms emanating from the federal government would trigger resistance from any state and local governments controlled by the opposition party. So although centralization has shrunk, certainly shrunk state autonomy, making states in many respects administrative arms of the federal government, COVID-19 showed that state sovereignty is far from dead. A national response can also rest on reciprocal federal state local coordination, which is the essence of cooperative federalism. This occurred in Germany, where Chancellor Angela Merkel and the 16 lender heads negotiated common COVID-19 guidelines and maintained good communications. Such cooperative federalism in the United States foundered on partisan polarization, President Trump's personal presidency, and also coronavirus's arrival during a presidential election year, an impeachment trial of a president running for reelection, and low public trust in the federal government and in fellow citizens. Although Trump held more than 90 conference calls with state, local, and tribal leaders between January and the end of March, he did not forge a reciprocally cooperative relationship. He sought generally to shift blame for failures onto governors, and his public statements featured bilateral rather than multilateral relations with governors, especially fused with some Democratic governors, including name calling and threats of federal funding cuts. He also battled with some Republican governors, such as Maryland's Larry Logan.
So hence, many governors turned to Vice President Mike Pence for help. The president's intergovernmental behavior cohered with his imagining the presidency as a platform for his personal expression. He did not conceptualize cooperative federalism as a partnership of shared powers aimed at achieving common objectives. Instead, the transgressive character of his presidency breached customary intergovernmental norms, although many agencies such as the CDC and the Army Corps of Engineers largely maintained those norms. I think governors also played a role in failing to formulate a cooperative nationwide response because of their party divisions. Partisanship is such a fundamental cleavage today that it affects how people view COVID-19 and make healthcare choices. A prominent feature of the US response has been sharp partisan divisions among both political leaders and citizens in their perceptions of the pandemic's severity and beliefs about appropriate policies and personal behaviors. Most democratic governors and mayors imposed earlier, longer and more draconian stay at home orders than did Republican executives. Democrats prioritized virus suppression. Republicans generally saw the economy as an equally or more important priority, namely a need to balance COVID-19 responses with economic sustainability and minimizing other collateral damages of lockdowns. So this partisanship has generated conflicts not only between the president and democratic governors, but also between governors of one party and county and municipal executives of the other party. Over time among citizens too, Democrats reduced social activities and practiced social distancing more than independents, while Republicans engaged in more social activities and less social distancing than did either group. So a president more amenable to intergovernmental cooperation might have tempered partisan conflict and provided political cover for Republican governors, but would still have had difficulty replicating Germany's cooperative federalism because more cross-party cooperation is present. Consequently, the dualism of American federalism, which is a barrier to unilateral federal government action, enabled the states to respond to COVID-19. Although dual federalism has long been declared dead, past dependency, as well as the system's constitutional structure, have ensured the endurance of important elements of dual federalism, which the U.S. Supreme Court reaffirmed in Gamble versus the United States in 2019. The vast lockdowns instituted by so many governors have no precedent in American history. The unprecedented exercises of power over citizens and the national conduct economy mandated by most governors and by many mayors and county executives have been extraordinary manifestations of dual federalism, demonstrating that the police power, which was not delegated to the United States, remains potent. The 10th Amendment appears to be alive and well in this respect. And to date, the US Supreme Court has not curtailed these state powers Although on September 14th, the U.S. District Court judge ruled that Pennsylvania governor's March lockdown violated various rights provisions of the U.S. Constitution. This ruling is on appeal. Under radical uncertainty, such as the novel coronavirus, it may be desirable for the states to collaborate with democracy, at least until sufficient knowledge is available to formulate and negotiate a sensible nationwide policy. The outlines of possible consensus did not emerge until several months into the pandemic, and many policymakers concluded that widespread testing, mask wearing, social distancing, and contact tracing are pre-vaccine keys to mitigation. Now, the Laboratories of Democracy concept supposes that some experiments will be adopted by other states and or the federal government. State and local officials nationwide have shared many policy ideas and used their national associations to disseminate information. However, information diffusion has been hampered by partisan barriers as it has been in other fields. Not all US states adopted a stay at home order. Those adopting them exhibited considerable variation in length, severity and reopening metrics. In turn, neither the White House nor Congress seems to have tried to use the results of state experiments to foster a cooperative uh, collaboration. Now, a potential liability of a laboratories of democracy approach is that infections can cross state lines. 
However, this was mitigated after many lockdowns by a 95% drop in domestic air travel by April 2, steep declines in ground, interstate public transportation, self-quarantines of out-of-state arrivals ordered by many states, and by many individuals curtailing their own uh, mobility. So the state's responses have not been ideal or as efficacious as might have been a cooperative federalism response, but absent the state's constitutional authority to act, the pandemic would have been worse. In this respect, dual federalism came to the rescue. The constitutional design allowed states to respond according to their diverse preferences and also largely confined the consequences of each state's cho choices to that state. So in my view, system failures were not due mainly to structural flaws, but to partisan polarization in particular, which itself is largely the result of the centralization that has occurred since the late 1960s and the nationalization of so many issues once decided by the states. Absent the polarization generated by nationalization's weakening of federalism, the system might have responded to the crisis in a more effective spirit of cooperative federalism. Now, a more centralized response may arrive next year. Uh, Vice President Biden says he will institute a more centralized response to COVID-19 if elected president. Uh, also, the federal court case coming out of Pennsylvania could ultimately curtail states' powers on individual rights grounds. The district court judge O'Connor, Jacobson versus there has been substantial development in federal civil liberties law. This development has seen a jurisprudential shift, he said, whereby federal courts are, were, have given greater deference to considerations of individual liberties as weighed against the exercise of state powers. So these two potential developments could substantially reshape the way states will be able to respond to future public crises, but in the current crises, the substantial police powers of the states did enable them to respond to the pandemic in their own ways. So thank you very much, Dr. Diddy. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kincaid. Uh, I'm personally, I'm fascinated uh, by your discussion of the problem that we have, which is that the ideal of cooperative federalism has, I think in your words, foundered on political polarization. And I, I think that's a theme that we'll come back to throughout the conference. So I'd, I'd love to hear you elaborate on that if possible in the Q&A time. Um, so thank you very much for that presentation. At, at this time, I'd like to turn over uh, uh, the screen, I, I guess, to Professor Celine. Um, Prof uh, Jennifer Celine is a Kinder Institute Assistant uh, Professor of Constitutional Democracy at the University of Missouri. Uh, she is the co-author of the source book of United States Executive Agencies. Uh, and her research explores how the federal bureaucracy functions in the American separation of powers system. Uh, so she's an ideal person uh, to have with us today to talk about federalism. Celine's scholarship has been published in political science, public administration, and law journals, and has been utilized by the Obama and Trump administrations, Congress, the Supreme Court, and the media. A proud graduate of Lebanon Valley College, Celine holds a JD from Wake Forest University and a PhD from Vanderbilt. Uh, prior to joining academia, she practiced administrative law and specialized in federal electricity market regulation and alternative energy development licensing and regulation. Um, Professor Celine, it, it really is an honor. Uh, thank you for joining us. The time is yours. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I wish I could actually be on campus and meet everyone in person and also take in uh, what seems to be beautiful scenery and quite a change from, you know, looking outside the drizzly Missouri landscape. Uh, unlike Professor Kincaid, I'm relatively new to the study of American federalism. And um, I actually started thinking about federalism more deeply once I became a professor. 
Uh, I always thought federalism was kind of boring until I started to have to teach it. And then I realized it was really, really interesting. And it prompted me even next semester, I'm teaching a class entitled Marijuana, Sports Gambling and COVID-19, The Real Story of Federalism. So um, <laughs> you too, if you're out there, can be a convert to federalism. Uh, but what I thought I would do is I'm gonna actually share my screen because I prepared a couple of slides um, for visual interest mainly. So. Let me do that right now. Okay, uh, so today what I thought I would do is uh, do three things. First, just give a really, really brief background about the legal parameters of American federalism and the historical principles behind our constitutional history. And then I would transition to talk about how federalism works today and has evolved over time. And then the, the, consequ the consequences for all of this as we move forward uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic. I thought I would start with this uh, beautiful cartoon from the uh, presidency of George Washington. Uh, in it, he reminds of his fellow politicians to keep the three pillars of our constitutional system, which are federalism, republicanism, and democracy in the hope of maintaining liberty and independence for citizens. And what is interesting about this is that the word federalism or even the word sovereignty does not actually appear in the constitution itself. But uh, we can think about federalism as the constitution's way of distributing decision-making authority. So at a minimum, this means that there are limits on the powers of the national government and that states have a definite and meaningful legal identity. So why do we have this setup? Well, two reasons. First, it takes advantage of divergent needs and local needs and political preferences. So because of the vast size of our, of our, of our country, uh, every state has a certain uh, set of interests that it would like to pursue and they vary across the country. And so the presence of different levels of government allows for a wider range of possibilities of citizen representation and political participation. And where my research comes in is that in addition to all of this, federalism diffuses and decentralizes political power. And this was one of the things that the framers were most concerned about. The idea is that we want to prevent the accumulation of power in any one political actor in order to limit governmental abuse and to protect individual citizens. And so just as the legislature, the executive branch and the judicial branch have the authority to check one another in our separation of power system. Similarly, the idea is that the states and the national government should have the power to check one another. And these tensions between the state and the federal government, as well as the three branches of government uh, are, exist to foster a more democratically accountable system. Now there's been calls in this, in this COVID-19 crisis uh, for the national government to do more. And at the same time, as pictured here from a rally, a boat rally in Charleston, South Carolina this summer, uh, there have also been calls for the government to refrain from acting and allow individual citizens to do their own thing. And so that begs the question, what are the constitutional principles that guide interaction between the federal government and the states. And the most important thing to remember is that the national government must be able to trace any one of its actions to uh, some clause in the constitution. And the constitution as Professor Kincaid suggested is very clear that the national government has the authority to regulate individual citizens, but not the states themselves. And this is called the anti-commandeering doctrine. The Constitution is very clear that Congress does not have the power to explicitly mandate states to do something. So Congress can allow states to do something. Uh, the national government can tell states to consider to do something or in, entice the states to do something with uh, money, but states must have a choice when implementing policy. 
And often uh, people wonder, well, what about the 10th Amendment? Where does that all fit in? Uh, which states that powers not delegated to the United States are reserved to either the states or the people. And uh, this is really part of the Federalist Revolution uh, that came out of the Rehnquist Court. And more recently, if you look at Supreme Court decisions on federalism, the court seems to be motivated more by a concern of federal regulatory power and less by a categorical distinction of, okay, well, what this is what the, the state authority is and this is what the federal authority is. And I'll return to this later, but this probably is the result of the evolution of our federalist system and statutory schemes requiring the sharing of power between the state and national government. So the classic story is that the federal, the federal government can do some things, it can entice the states to do other things, and then the states reserve the right to regulate in certain domains. But in reality, things are not that clear cut. So the constitution provides the outer boundaries of federal power, but these boundaries have been really difficult to draw and enforce. And this has been highlighted by the pandemic as most legal provisions that contemplate national emergencies tend to arise out of national security issues uh, and not necessarily public health crises in the way that, that we're operating today. Um, and there's been developments also in the way that state and uh, national government interact with one another. So historically, the federal government has relied on state and local actors to in the development and implementation of federal policy. So this can be seen from this quote here from the Natural Resources Committee, which conducted a series of special studies in the midst of the Great Depression, yet another uh, crisis, um, on interstate cooperation. And the suggestion here is that if you look at the everyday activities of all levels of government in any given area, there are many functions for which coordinated action is required for the solution of public problems. And United States statutory law is filled with delegation strategies of various sorts that require co cooperation depending on the needs of the time. So just to provide you with some examples, for uh, you can think about when the national government provides money to cover state costs of implementing federal law. And a classic example of this would be with the Affordable Care Act and healthcare more generally. Uh, you can also think about the fact that the national government oft often calls on states to enforce federal law. And the classic example here would be with uh, certain aspects of immigration policy. And the national government can also call on the states in more informal ways. Uh, asking state and local officials to report information to federal agencies or including state and federal members in administrative decision making. And these relationships between state and federal officials are ever evolving. And that means that federalism does not consist of a set of, of, set of fixed relationships. So for example, according to Abby Gluck's study of the Affordable Care Act, that law in and of itself contain, provides for at least five different types of relationships between the state and national government. And so if there's a proliferation of the types of relationships between the state and national government, then that means that there's opportunity for strategic action among political actors. And this means that federalism can become a means rather than an end. So how does this all work in reality? Well, every branch of the state governments now have a role in creating, implementing, and interpreting federal law and policy. And the parameters of which are subject to ongoing negotiations by players in the system according to the costs and benefits of a particular set of relationships for each actor. And so if you think about the national government's strategy, it's often to pass a law that touts state flexibility in program design and promoting innovation, while at the same time shifting painful policy choices to the states. So national law will keep many possible outcomes open and then by delaying the definitive details of the program and passing that on to the states, from the national government's perspective, you produce few losers and many winners. 
and that makes federal action more politically palatable. And you can actually see this in the CARES Act, which was passed back in March, and it provided financial relief to a whole host of different uh, organizations, businesses, individuals, and state uh, officials, but it left the really, really hard decisions regarding allocation and implementation to either administrative agencies at the federal or state level. And this has two effects. As Professor Kincaid suggested, uh, there's been an increase in partisanship. So over time, the politics surrounding these programs tend to shift as ideological and material debates emerge. And not surprisingly, tape states typically implement federal programs in alignment with their own preferences, initiatives, and timelines and interests. And this can amplify competition between the political parties. So political competition has actually come to be channeled not through separation of powers, say legislature versus executive, or even federalism, states versus national government, but instead through the political parties themselves, Democrat versus Republican. In addition, this sort of model highlights disparities across all 50 states. So in theory, all 50 states stand on relatively equal footing in our constitutional system, but there's vast disparities in both the size and capacity of states to um, affect their ability to respond, particularly in a crisis such as the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is important because say the state infrastructure of a state like New York's ability to be able to respond to the pandemic varies different, is very different from say a state uh, like Mississippi. And in addition, as states rush to make policies to deal with the pandemic, they often lack full and easily accessible information about the approaches that other states are taking. And this is particularly true in technical areas like the, the the pandemic, areas that require specialized and idiosyncratic knowledge often involve relatively complicated regulatory schemes that are governed by multiple state agencies, making it very difficult for everyone to sort of figure out what's going on. So what are the consequences for all of this as we move forward in uh, the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, legally, our constitutional doctrine does not account fully for the way that federalism works today. And there's actually some unanswered legal questions that uh, likely will be clarified over the coming weeks, months, and probably years, in part because we've been asking the wrong questions. Scholars and jurists alike tend to focus on state sovereignty and the conditions under which the federal government may preempt state action. So for example, clearly President Trump can't tell the states what to do. But this is the easy case. Uh, because the federal state dynamic is more reciprocal than that, there's little consensus that exists about the general principles to apply when both the state and federal government uh, are legitimate sources of legal and political authority. And this will be, again, a potentially an issue as we move forward in the pandemic. In addition, there's been an expansion of executive power so we know that there's a documented rise in the size, authority, and politicization of the executive branch. And the transfer of power to the executive branch is often heightened in times of crisis. So at the onset of an emergency, citizens tend to look to executive officials to direct governmental action, governors, President Trump, the like. Um, and in addition, as a result of their deliberative nature, uh, the legislative and judicial branches often tend to play a more reactive role. And this is echoed in state responses to COVID-19. For example, uh, at the state level, only 32 legislatures have, state legislatures have actually passed a COVID-19 uh, legislation, while every state governor has taken multiple executive actions to try to deal with the pandemic. In addition, as I, as has been, you know, referenced already, there has been an increase in partisan conflict and President Trump's actions over the past couple of months really illustrate this point when his administration began to respond to the crisis, issuing guidelines and emergency use authorizations. He used his relationships with various governors for partisan gain. So in his one more one of 
his more colorful uh, statements on the issue, Trump tweeted, tell, as a Professor Kincaid actually hinted, tell the Democratic governors that Mutiny on the Bounty, Bounty is one of my favorite movies, a good old fashioned mutiny every now and then is an exciting and invigorating thing to watch, especially when the mutineers need so much from the captain. And such comments suggest that political competition may no longer flow through the separation of powers or federalist system, but rather through the political parties. Uh, in addition, I think it's worth mentioning that all of this has highlighted some real uh, ad election administration concerns for our federalist system. So elections provide citizens for a way to comment on policies that political parties adopt. Uh, however, elections are a classic example of federal how federalism presents the nation uh, with new challenges. So the regulation and administration of elections, as we have all seen over the recent months, occurs at the state level. And while this is designed to enhance geographically based representation, uh, decentralization results in tremendous variation in the legal framework that governs the electoral process. And because of that, how states delineate their responsibility for elect elections, approximately 8,000 minimum uh, different jurisdictions administer American elections. And not only does this make the governing process quite complex, but it also has profound implications for how administrators implement and citizens will experience the framework in the upcoming 2020 elections in the midst of a pandemic. We've already seen this play out in the past few months with litigation arising over several states voting and election policies. And then finally, uh, all of this has uh, implications for accountability. Even if all citizens have equal opportunity to vote under comparable electoral rules, one could question whom citizens should hold accountable for COVID-19 policy. So when states and the national government act in the same policy space, voters may not be able to discern whom to blame or who to reward when things go well. And the accountability problem only amplifies when you add unelected administrators to the mix. So for example, what if the Food and Drug Administration moves too quickly in approving a coronavirus vaccine that has harmful side effects? The president will undoubtedly blame faceless bureaucrats in the deep state. State governors will blame the Trump administration for fast tracking dangerous drugs. And then voters are left to wonder why government seems so dysfunctional and who we can elect to fix the problem. And so with that, I will say thank you again for having me. I'm looking forward to attending the rest of the conference and learning quite a lot. Thank you so much, Professor Celine. Um, I, I think many of us can understand uh, this idea that federalism seems boring uh, until you either have to teach it or until you start looking into the many ways that it influences our lives. So um, please keep us updated on your class on uh, was marijuana, sports gambling and COVID-19. Um, Correct. <laughs> and and also, also your research, which really it sounds quite fascinating. Thank you, Professor Celine. Um, John Deenan is next. Um, and so I'll just uh, introduce him briefly and turn the time over. Uh, professor Deenan is a professor of politics and international affairs at Wake Forest University. He is the author of several books, including State Constitutional Politics, Governing by Amendment in the American States, and the American State Constitutional Tradition. He also writes an annual review of state constitutional developments in the 50 states and has published numerous articles analyzing various aspects of the US federal system. He is, current, he is the current editor of Publius, the Journal of Federalism, and a past chair of the Federalism and Intergovernmental Relations section of the American Political Science Association. He received his PhD from the University of Virginia. Professor Deenan, uh, we're always delighted to see you. Um, thank you very much for joining us and the time is yours. Andy, thank you very much. COVID is generating all sorts of research questions for federalism scholars, as highlighted by the wide range of questions addressed in this conference. 
a conference I should say I'm very pleased to be participating in. But among the various items that COVID has placed on the research agenda, I want to highlight the importance of placing legal questions at the center of federalism scholarship. At one time, legal questions were central to federalism scholarship, but this changed somewhat over time. Scholars began to shift their focus, began to turn to other aspects of federalism, push legal questions somewhat to the side, not on this panel, certainly, but in, in the broad base of federalism scholarship, one might say it has not taken central stage. I would argue that COVID provides several good reasons to return legal questions to a more prominent place in federalism scholarship. I'll highlight today two main benefits of doing so. One, our focus should be on clarifying the boundaries of federal and state power, and thereby helping citizens and public officials better understand what the federal government can and cannot do in responding to a health emergency. A number of questions have been raised and conflicting answers given about federal authority in responding to COVID. Simply put, there are some unrealistic expectations about what the federal government has the power to do. In this context, federalism scholars can be very helpful, perhaps more helpful than we've been so far, in informing the public debate about the limits of federal power at a time when many in the public are unaware that there are even any limits on federal power and have wrongly assumed that federal officials can take actions they simply cannot undertake. A second focus of my remarks today, and a second focus of how legal questions can take center stage, should be on the internal division of power within state governments. By undertaking a comparative analysis and assessment of the relative powers of governors and legislators in health emergencies. With the intent here of informing ongoing debates about revising these state institutional arrangements. COVID has highlighted the sweeping powers of governors in health emergencies. And I would say it's shown the need for scholars to study the extent and possible limits on governor's powers. We have plenty of studies of presidential emergency powers. What are needed though at this point are similar studies of governor's emergency powers, especially when there's a lot of ongoing interest in revising these powers to involve additional officials in emergency decision-making. Let me take up these two points in turn, beginning with the need for greater attention to the constitutional limits on federal power, even in emergency times. There's been a lot of discussion about whether the federal government could and should do more to respond to COVID. Let me start by identifying a set of very clear cases where the federal government clearly possesses authority to take certain actions, even if it may not be always currently exercising its full authority. Federal officials can certainly restrict entry to the US from countries affected by the virus. They can order the quarantine of individuals who have or are suspected to have the virus when they try to enter the country or cross state lines. Federal officials can promulgate guidelines that might offer advice to state officials on when to close or reopen schools and businesses. Federal officials can order businesses to prioritize production of material needed to combat the virus. Federal officials finally can fund equipment and research regarding the virus. There are simply no doubts about federal authority to do any of what I've just mentioned. If a President Biden wanted to do even more of any of these things than a President Trump, he would have full power to do so. But it's just as important to recognize a second set of cases where the federal government clearly lacks the power to take many other steps that have been critical in responding to COVID and have necessarily inevitably fallen to states, ordering the closure of schools and businesses, limiting the movement of individuals who are not trying to cross state borders, limiting the size of gatherings, ordering individuals to wear masks. The federal government lacks power to do any of this. This has important implications, I would say, for understanding U.S. response to COVID. It was always going to be the case, due to the division of powers in the U.S. federal system, that state officials would exercise most responsibility and make most of the important decisions for responding to the virus, because states possess the lion's share of powers in this area. In this regard, I would say that federalism scholars could have been even more helpful over the past year in helping citizens and governing officials understand that the prominence of state activity in responding to COVID is not best understood as a backup plan adopted only because the federal government chose to be inactive. 
Rather, it was the inevitable product of the division of power constitutionally in the US federal system and the limits on federal power, which ensured that states would necessarily be the key actors. Now, there's still another set of cases. I've talked about cases that the federal government clearly has the power to do. I've talked about cases that the federal government clearly does not have the power to do. There is another set of cases that fall in more of a gray area. The legal questions are closer and the answers are more uncertain. And we're federal, federalism scholars, they ha may have more work to do in coming up with clear answers in these areas. For instance, could a president ban all travel between certain states in a way that Trump suggested he might do in the spring for travel to and from New York, but pulled back from doing? And as already mentioned in this panel, can a president impose a moratorium on all evictions as the Trump administration has done? Is this a plausible reading of statute law? And it is, a, is it a power that the federal government could validly exercise, even if so? And could Congress or the president issue nationwide directives, not as a direct order to individuals, but by threatening states with a loss of funds for failing to take certain actions? Now, prior to the 1990s, there would have been much less uncertainty about federal authority to act in response to COVID, both in the cases where federal government clearly lacks authority today and in these more difficult legal cases that I've just mentioned. Simply put, the commerce power was understood from the mid-1930s mid to the mid-1990s as granting the federal government near plenary power and with few limits. But this all changed in the 1990s. The Rehnquist Court and later the Roberts Court limited federal authority under the commerce power as it pertains to criminalizing guns in and around schools, as it pertains to permitting individuals to file civil suits to address gender motivated violence, or as it pertains to mandating individual purchase of health insurance. Decisions were not only issued in regard to the commerce power and placing limits there, decisions have been issued from the 1990s onward invoking the 10th Amendment to limit the ability of federal officials to commandeer state and local officials whether by telling states how they must handle low level radioactive waste, telling sheriffs they must run background checks on handgun purchases, or telling states they must ban internet gaming. The court said no to all of this. The court also limited the federal spending power. That is the ability to use federal grants to induce states to do certain things. The court had in an earlier drinking age case in the 1980s, made clear there were limits on the spending power, but it declined to actually overturn a national uniform drinking age in that earlier case. But in an Affordable Care Act case this decade, the court invoked these limits on the spending power to actually require a change in federal policy. In this case, telling federal officials they could not threaten a state that chose not to expand Medicaid with the loss of the entirety of that state's Medicaid fund. Finally, I should mention that recent decisions have also limited federal power to enforce the post-Civil War amendments, holding in many cases that Congress can't allow individuals to kind of uh, file damages suits against state governments, using the 11th Amendment to do so, holding that Congress cannot use an outdated formula in the Voting Rights Act to determine which states must get pre-approval from federal officials for any election law changes. In short, my reason for running through these lines of cases since the 1990s is to say that the Supreme Court of the last 30 years has issued a number of important decisions placing limits on federal power. Occasionally, these rulings have attracted attention, such as during litigation over various Trump administration immigration directors. But generally, I would say that these federalism decisions have not gotten the full attention they deserve. And this failure to get the full attention they deserve, I would say has hampered the public's understanding and the understanding of some public officials about what is possible in responding to COVID among other actions. I would say part of the reason for the failure to pay sufficient attention to these decisions is because many of these rulings have not come in highly salient cases outside of the Voting Rights Act and the Affordable Care Act cases. And so this lack of politically salient rulings may have led some scholars to pay less attention to these cases and miss out on their doctrinal importance. And I would say part of the reason for the failure of scholars to gain clarity on the meaning of these decisions is simply attributable to a lack of clarity on the part of the Supreme Court itself in issuing some of these rulings. Let me just give an example, a very important example. 
The court made clear that the spending power will not allow Congress to threaten non-Medicaid expansion states with a loss of 100% of their existing Medicaid money. But we don't have any other analogous cases, and the court didn't give us any other analogous cases, of a funding source that makes up such a large part of state budgets. And so we lack a good understanding of exactly how to apply this spending clause doctrine in cases where less funding is at stake, less than 100% of loss. Well, and we're also where the funds are less important to state budgets than is clearly the case with Medicaid. The key point as I wrap up this first part of my remarks and turn to my second part, is that the debate over the federal response to COVID would benefit from a much greater attention to these recent federalism decisions. And federalism scholars are well positioned to inform this ongoing debate about the COVID response in key ways. Federalism scholars can inform the public that the federal government lacks plenary power, even in an emergency, and that federal officials simply lack the power to do many of the things that have turned out to be crucial in responding to COVID and were necessarily undertaken by state governments. And then federalism scholars can, in other areas, they can be helpful for citizens and public officials by clarifying the meaning and application of recent federalism decisions. Well, let me turn to a second way that COVID might influence the research agenda of federalism scholars. And that's by focusing attention on the division of powers within state governments specifically on the extraordinary emergency powers wielded by governors. In responding to COVID, governors have not only unilaterally declared uh, states of emergency and issued emergency declarations, but in many states, governors have been able to wield emergency powers for as long as they wish. And they've been empowered to take an impressive range of emergency actions in a unilateral fashion, ordering business to shut down and then deciding which ones can reopen and when ordering schools to shut down, and then deciding under what circumstances they can reopen. Ordering individuals to stay in their homes, ordering individuals to wear masks when they're out of their homes. Prior to this year, the public just had little occasion to think about the impressive emergency powers granted to governors. And I would say scholars spent little time analyzing the grants of power. Scholars have always followed public in this way. I'd say part of the reason for this lack of attention is we, we just haven't seen governor's emergency powers exercised on a sustained basis in a nationwide way before. Certainly governors have declared emergencies in response to hurricanes, other natural disasters, but usually for shorter periods of time, usually it's just been confined to several states. Nothing like what we've seen this year. And then another part of the reason why more attention hasn't been paid to governor's emergency powers is be, it's due to the tendency of scholars, no less than the general public, just to focus so much of our attention on the federal government and the presidency, and not to pay as much attention as we should to state governments and governors, even when so much of governance takes place in the states. Well, this long-standing lack of attention to governors and emergency powers obviously changed in 2020. And with this increased public attention to governors and emerging powers has come a fair amount of concern about the extent of these powers. It's resulted in one case in a lot of litigation in state and federal courts. We've already heard some about this in this panel. Some of these cases have charged that governor's orders violate individual rights. And some of these cases argue that the governor's orders exceed the boundaries of separation of powers principles. The vast majority of these lawsuits have failed with judges routinely relying on a 1905 US Supreme Court precedent Jacobson v. Massachusetts, that recognize an extensive police power that gives significant deference to public officials act during, during a health crisis. But some of these lawsuits have been successful. In a few of the successful cases, federal judges have invalidated governor's use of emergency powers in very particular circumstances. For instance, when governors have tried to limit attendance at religious services more strictly than for other retail establishments. But then there are three rulings that have challenged governor's emergency orders in a more sweeping fashion. Let me just go over briefly these three. In one case, a federal district judge in Pennsylvania, as was already noted in this panel, ruled the governor's orders violated First Amendment free assembly guarantees, as well as 14th Amendment equal protection and due process guarantees. In a second case, the Wisconsin Supreme Court held that state executive officials had not followed proper administrative procedures in issuing certain emergency orders. And then in a third ruling, 
And this poses the most direct challenge to gubernatorial power of all of these rulings. The Michigan Supreme Court held the governor had improperly extended an initial emergency order. The court invalidated the statute the governor relied on, holding it to be an improper delegation of legislative power to the executive branch. Well, public dissatisfaction with governor's emergency orders has not only taken the form of lawsuits, it has also led to calls for reforming the statutes that grant governors these powers. I should note that in most cases, governors are not acting pursuant to explicit state constitutional grants of power. They're acting pursuant to explicit grants of state statutes. A lot of reform efforts are underway to try to reform these statutes by involving other officials more heavily in the decision-making process during emergencies. Now, Utah made a minor change in this regard early this spring. The legislature passed a law requiring the governor to notify certain members of the legislature 24 hours prior to taking health emergency actions. So actually Utah was the first state actually to actually reform its, its state emergency statutes in a minor way, admittedly. But the Utah legislature is now considering going much further in rewriting the state's emergency power statute. Utah is far from alone. Movements are afoot in a number of other states to make even more significant changes to emergency power statutes. But generally the idea is either try to limit the time that an emergency declaration can, make, can remain in effect or make it more difficult for the governor to renew an emergency order or make it easier for the legislature to overturn an existing emergency order. In short, and to get to my point about how federalism scholars can contribute to these debates, they can do so in two ways. In the first place, there's plenty of opportunity to revisit the logic of the Jacobson v. Massachusetts precedent, a 115-year-old precedent that has recently resurfaced in a major way in state and federal court decisions upholding most governor's emergency orders. There just hasn't been as much attention to this rather sweeping ruling until the past year when it's been relied on so frequently. To what extent, the question is raised, does the logic of this ruling hold continuing persuasiveness? We've already started to see some challenges to it, but is it broadly persuasive still with its strong deference to public officials' emergency orders? My point is that a lot of doctrinal analysis could be undertaken regarding these emergency powers doctrines in the same way that extensive doctrinal analysis has been conducted of Supreme Court precedents governing presidential emergency powers. A lot of ink has been spilled looking at the steel seizure case, the Curtis Wright case governing presidential power. We need a similar type of analysis and energy spent analyzing these doctrines governing state emergency power. And then the second thing that federalism scholars can do and this is where I would say that we can be especially helpful. And there's, there's a lot of work to be done in categorizing and assessing the statutory arrangements regarding governor's emerging powers with an eye to informing the ongoing debates about whether and how to reform these state statutes. What is needed in part is to categorize governor's emergency powers in the 50 states at each stage of an emergency. Now, we already know something about this. We know that at the emergency declaration stage, only two states, Georgia and Oklahoma, require the legislature to sign off on a governor's emergency declaration. But more study is needed of what is the legislator's roles at other stages of the process. In terms of how many states allow the legislature to overturn an emergency declaration and by what sort of vote, a joint resolution that can be vetoed or by a concurrent resolution that cannot be vetoed. And then how many states impose a time limit on an emergency declaration? And how do states provide for renewal of an emergency declaration? Is it enough simply for the governor to just issue a new emergency declaration after the initial time has expired? Or must the governor at the renewal stage get the affirmative approval of the legislature, as is the case in some states? This sort of compilation and categorization of state emergency powers, it's just starting to be put together. And then the next stage is, after we kind of get a compilation, 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 is to assess the advantages and disadvantages of these various state arrangements. What can be gained from studying the range of state approaches here? 
some states giving legislators a lot of opportunities for influence and other states providing few opportunities. Are certain arrangements more conducive to good governance than other arrangements? And how do governor's emergency powers and state legislative checks compare with the president's emergency powers and congressional checks? Might congressional statutes such as the War Powers Act and National Emergencies Act serve as models for states to emulate in revising their own statutes? Let me conclude. My overall point is that legal questions about the balance of power between federal and state governments, and also legal questions about the balance of power within state governments have come to the forefront of public consciousness as a result of COVID. Federalism scholars have insights to offer to inform ongoing public debates at both the federal and state level. Federalism scholars also have more work to do in some areas in a way that might require moving legal issues even more to the forefront of the federalism research agenda. Thanks very much. Thank you very <laughs> much, uh, Professor Dean. And um, so I'd like to turn to questions now, uh, but just thank you again for this helpful and thought provoking presentation. Um, for time, I'd love to move to questions. We have a number of questions coming in from YouTube and here at the center. Um, I'm gonna start with one and I'm going to invite Professor Kincaid uh, to respond, but I'll invite all of you to respond if you'd like. Uh, the first question is from Stephen or Stephen Seabury, uh, a teacher at Providence Hall High School. Uh, and he writes, in view of the negative effects of partisanship on federalism, has there been studies of how rhetoric affects federalism? And maybe I'll expand the question. Have there been studies of how rhetoric affects um, constitution or our, uh, constitutional studies or our understanding uh, of the constitution? I'll ask Professor Kincaid uh, to start, but I'll ask everyone to respond if you'd like. Um, yeah, I'm not aware specifically of studies that address what seems to be the question that's being proposed uh, here. Uh, rhetoric certainly pays a role in terms of how issues in the federal system get framed. And so I would point to my discussion of uh, the national federalists defining cooperative federalism as the willingness of states to implement federal policies. I mean, that's a very different definition of cooperative federalism from what we historically understood cooperative federalism to be. And so as the concepts that we use to discuss federalism get changed by rhetoric over time, yeah, that can affect uh, outcomes in the, in the system. Professor Seelan uh, or, or, or Professor Dinan, would you like to jump in on that? No, I, I would say that um, well, I'm not aware of any like systematic empirical studies of this question. Uh, I think it's important to think about rhetoric when it comes in, uh, to account political accountability. Uh, one thing that our federalist system allows political officials to do is to transfer blame to other officials when things aren't going their way. Well, I couldn't do anything because X official wouldn't let me or the national government, that's their job or the national government can say, oh no, we can't do anything, that's the state's job. And so there, it, there are real important questions to be thinking about when it comes to rhetoric and shifting political accountability across the different uh, levels of government. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to pick up on a theme um, from a few different questions. It seems that, um, quite a few people are concerned or have questions related to partisanship. And so I'll select just one of them. Um, and this is to everyone on the panel. I'll invite everyone to respond. Um, the question is, is federalism partly the cause of the partisan issues because it makes it harder for the governing party to govern? Is this system of decentralized power uh, ill-suited to respond to a deadly pandemic. So I'll open it, open it up to anyone who would like to ask questions. 
Well, I'll, I'll take it up first. I mean, I just point to other federal countries, and I mentioned Germany several times, where cooperative federalism in Germany worked rather well. And so my argument in my presentation was that we have not been able to institute that kind of cooperative federalism in the United States because of partisanship. Uh, in my view, the partisan polarization we have today is due largely to the decline of federalism, and that is the nationalization of issues that were previously decided by the states. And the framers realized this in, the, in founding the Constitution. I mean, one of the key ideas of federalism is unity while preserving diversity. And they recognized that they could not have the federal government address every public policy issue because that would tear the country. Well, they wouldn't have been able to have a constitution. So without leaving things to the states to make decisions. Um, so as we nationalize more and more policy decisions, we get more and more heated debate in Washington, D.C. and polarization. And the polarization we have in our party system corresponds pretty much exactly with the rise of centralization since the late 1960s. So um, I think the responses of other federal countries indicate, and particularly Germany, that a non-centralized federal system can work very well in responding to a pandemic and respond much better than, than, uh, than, than some unitary system. So uh, I think that the problem again is the, uh, the way partisanship is thwarted uh, cooperative federalism. Andy, could I jump in there as well and pick up? I mean, I think the question that you've selected is probably the central question for the conference perhaps. And that is, is a federal system able to respond effectively to a public health emergency? I mean, here's just what I would say a, a few things on that. There are advantages and disadvantages of a federal system. And as Professor Kincaid said, it all depends on what type of federal system we're talking about and the behavior of individuals within that federal system. But if we just look at the response to the COVID, what have been the advantages of a federal system? It has allowed certain states to issue lockdown orders and other states not to. It's, it's, it's notable that not all 50 states closed their schools in the spring. Several states actually continued operating their schools and that was allowable and that was possible in a federal system. It's also the case that laboratories of democracy about which we've already heard, laboratories of democracy can lead to a federal government learning from states, but also can lead from states learning from other states. There are a lot of governors who said, I'm watching very carefully the experience of what happens in the state next to me. They're opening up quickly. I wanna see how that works. That was possible in a way that might not have been possible in, in, in absence of a strong federal system. And then we would also say that it's likely possible that responses were quicker and you could change, turn more nimbly in a federal system. It is true that the CARES Act got passed pretty quickly. Also true that we haven't seen a second stimulus pass very quickly. It's just more possible at the local level and state level to act quickly. Those are all I would say advantages of the US was better off in a federal system and had it had a different system. That being said, there are some downsides and some of these have already been mentioned. One is the downside of competition. Your competition can be a good thing in a lot of ways when you're competing to have the cleanest environment or the best education system. But if what are you're competing for scarce resources such as ventilators and other equipment. If, in that kind of situation, you heard governors say, I'm at a disadvantage here. I wish we didn't have this competition. And the final thing I mentioned disadvantage and Jennifer mentioned this earlier is that accountability is a real challenge in a federal system. If you're in Salt Lake City and you're happy with what's happened, well, let's say you're unhappy, who do you blame or credit? The mayor, the governor, Congress, the president? We've already heard, I just wanna come back to that point that it's very difficult to do. It puts citizens at a real disadvantage and that is a clear downside of the federal system. And I like to pick up on this idea about allowing uh, different states to respond in different ways. And then also sort of comparing us to other federalist uh, systems across the country. Uh, I recently participated in an international conference where we all shared our experiences in, in the federalist system. And while Germany hasn't really seen partisan conflict, they have seen within party conflict uh, and then Places, or countries like Italy, Switzerland, and Canada have really seen that these differential state or uh, local responses have reinforced cultural conflict and economic disparities, uh, linguistic disparities. 
uh, within within the country. And, and I think we can see that here in the United States as well. So that's just something to be aware of as we allow each individual state to act in a different way. It fosters uh, it fosters innovate, innovation, but can then also reinforce cultural cleavages within our system itself. All right, thank you. Um, before we uh, summarize and, and wrap up, I'd love to ask one, at least we can't escape from this panel without asking at least one hot button question. Uh, so I'm gonna ask this question for everyone. This one came in addressed to Professor Dinan, but I, I invite you all to answer if you like. Um, so the question is, um, is there a limit or an expiration date to the emergency powers exercised by the governors in their response to COVID? So we'll start with you, Professor Deenan, and if you'd like, uh, both of you could also answer if you'd like. Oh, thank you very much for that question. I'm, I'm glad to start off here. And I'll just start by saying that as I was preparing for the conference, I wish I was in, in, in Utah to be kind of experiencing the, the beauty and, and there, but I was able to kind of look at some newspaper headlines and stories of today. And they were all about, a lot of them about, about the Utah legislature debating how they could reform the state's emergency statutes. And they were running over to say, well, could we do this? Could we do this? And they said, even if we don't pass this bill this year, we're probably gonna come back next year and do this. And so the simple answer, what would the Utah legislature have at their disposal if they surveyed the 50 states and said, what, what's available to us? They would find, as with so much else in the American federal system, a large diversity of approaches in the states. Mm -hmm. And so simply put, there are some states that say there's a 30 day or a 60 day limit on an emergency declaration. But then the key question becomes, what happens at the end of that time? Now, in some states, it's simply possible that the governor can just issue another emergency order and say, the clock starts again. But not in all states. As I was indicating, a few states say, okay, we'll let the governor have the unilateral power to issue the initial emergency order. We'll give a time period on that. But once we get to the expiration of that initial time period, the governor must get the affirmative approval of the legislature before going on. This is what, when I was indicating my remarks that we, a lot of study is, 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 would be in order. Does that make sense? Is that, is that a healthy balance of allowing executive quick action of the kind that Alexander Hamilton called for in the Federalist Papers that one wants an executive to take quick and decisive action at the beginning of a crisis, but would still allow other officials to be brought more to the decision-making table as the length of time goes on? I could see some advantages to that. Are there still other ways of doing this? Yes, but the short answer to the question is it depends on what state we're talking about. And even then it depends on what happens at the end of that time period. Thank you very much for, for that very important question. Professor Thalen or Professor Kincaid? Well, I would just point again to the role of partisanship here and limiting governor's powers. I mean, the governor of Pennsylvania, who's a Democrat, has vetoed seven bills by the legislature attempting to curtail the governor's powers. And there's not enough so far to override the veto because the Democrats line up with the governor and the Republican majority does, does not. Uh, I would appoint the same thing with the court cases that John mentioned. Uh, uh, in Wisconsin and Michigan, they were both divided decisions and uh, the Republicans voted to uh, curtail the governor's powers and the, the Democrats on the courts did not. I mean, Wisconsin is a uh, nonpartisan court technically, but the conservatives, you know, it's clear who's Republican, who's Democrat. In Pennsylvania, the court is majority Democrat and so it upheld the governor's power. So neither the legislature nor the, gov uh, the, the court has, has been willing, been able to uh, curtail the powers. I think John's point is good in the terms of, I think in uh, going down the line, a lot of legislatures are going to be looking at this question. And now that we have the experience with COVID-19, I think they're going to be reconsidering the, the governor's powers. But right now, they're, they're, most of them are pretty much paralyzed along political lines. And uh, those will become less salient once the crisis is over and they get a chance to kind of reconsider these, 
um, powers in a more generic manner. I also, I think this question of administrative procedures providing some sort of check on executive power is actually quite interesting. Um, we typically, we, we know that administrative procedures will slow executive action, but we also know that administrative procedures can build, bake into the system some uh, preferences for certain interests or certain parties. And so I think it would be quite interesting to, to think about as a thought exercise, if we were to adopt these procedures to sort of slow executive action, would we be baking into the system certain partisan preferences? And what does that mean as we look forward, um, look forward past this pandemic uh, for governmental responses to, to other policy issues? All right, I think we, thank you. I, I think we have time for just one last question. I'd like to go around the panel with this one final question. Um, it's a general question, but I, I promise we did not plant this, but it's the one I would like to conclude with. Uh, the viewer asks, um, what do you think are some actions that could be taken to improve the relationship and cooperation between the federal and state governments in dealing with the pandemic. Uh, I'd like to, maybe perhaps we could start with uh, uh, John Kincaid and then uh, go around the panel. I wish you hadn't started with me because I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I mean, really in, in the face of the kind of partisan polarization we are experiencing, uh, it's hard to say how we can remedy these problems and produce more cooperation. And even if the Democrats capture Congress and the White House, uh, they're not going to capture every state. And so we are still going to have uh, a lot of partisan conflict continuing uh, under, under a new administration. So it's, it's very unfortunate that it's hard to see a way, a clear way on how we can, you know, short of de-escalating the system and depolarizing the system, how we can improve this cooperation. I'll go left to right, at least on my screen. So Professor Salen. Uh, so I would say the, the easy cop out answer is sustained dialogue, but I understand that given these plotters and considerations, a sustained dialogue might not actually be possible. But one really simple, well not, simple but easy and really helpful thing would be to establish some sort of formal way for states to share their actions uh, and, and federal government to share its research and information about the pandemic. And so if we had some sort of formal pipeline for information about different states' responses to be shared, uh, then everyone could be learning from each other. Uh, and that would help foster uh, more effective policymaking. Uh, in addition, I think that there needs to be a little bit more sustained dialogue with respect to the budgetary consequences of all of this, something that uh, we haven't talked that much about here, but uh, we really need to start thinking about providing everyone uh, with the resources to really handle this pandemic in, in an effective way. And yeah, this to so much that could be said in, in response to that question. I'm not sure how much I actually have to say, but there's much that, that should be said. But let me just focus on this aspect. Suppose our concern is, and we say, well, what is our concern that we'd like to improve? And suppose our concern is that we wish the federal government had, for instance, um, done more to pass a second stimulus bill and, and, and it's not dragging its feet, it's not so difficult. I mean, that gets to the heart of the polarization that Professor Kincaid has talked about that, that just grips Washington politics. It's, it's not that state politics are any less polarized. It's just that oftentimes in state governments, you just have one party that just has a clear supermajority. In California, Democrats and Republicans aren't any less divided. It's just Democrats have all the power. It's not just in some states such as, as a kind of an Idaho or some states that Republicans and Democrats is just less divided. It's just there's fewer Democrats. And so at the national level, one clear solution to this is for one party just to take full control to gain the presidency, to gain the House, to gain the Senate, and then to eliminate the filibuster or to get 60 votes in the Senate as Democrats did for about a six month period in 2009 and early 2010. If we wanna get an end to gridlock, 
that's one way to do that is for one party just to uh, seize control and say, we'll get things done now. I'm not saying that's a, a, a preferable approach, but I'm saying that we may well see that approach taken in coming months. And so we may well see whether that actually addresses the questions of polarization, at least polarization as it leads to gridlock. Well, thank you. <laughs> Are there any other further comments uh, either by, uh, by other panelists that you'd like to, uh, to add to what has been said before? Any final thoughts? I'll just say thank you for, for this conference, which um, is, is, is addressing just a crucially important set of questions. And I'm so glad to have been uh, invited to be participate and, and wish all the best for the remainder of today and, and tomorrow. I would say thank you as well again for inviting me for the conference. And I look forward to uh, really learning from uh, other presentations. So I hope I know how to get back on the system after this panel is over. <laughs> okay. Yeah, agree. Uh, Thanks for the opportunity to learn from so many people who've studied this for way longer than I have. So I'm looking forward to it as well. Well, thank, thank you all genuinely for your time. Uh, thank you for your wonderful work uh, that you do and are doing uh, to help us all understand um, federal state relations, intergovernmental relations and how it impacts our lives. Uh, I'd like to end by inviting everyone to join us at our next panel. Our next panel begins at 11 o'clock Mountain Time. Uh, we'll be talking about COVID-19, federalism, and the US uh, Constitution. So thank you so much again uh, to everyone, and we will reconvene at 11 a.m.